possibly go wrong in the human body is covered in your pediatric textbook. I mean, everything. And I, I get it. You know, children can get sick just like grown-ups. But do you really need pediatric hypertension to be any different than adult hypertension? Not remarkably so. And so what I've tried to do is cut out all of the, uh, all of the adult stuff on here and, uh, and kind of get a, a better understanding of pediatrics. So your recommendation is when we go through the chapters to have the slides beside us to make sure we're not reading? Or Pretty much. I would go reading. like, yeah, read based on what the slide says. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool, cool. Now I did not recognize that I had that many uh, slides on here. Yeah. I thought that I oh, cut a lot out. Maybe you still cut a lot out. Maybe I did. I mean, the respiratory chapter itself had 108 slides on everything known to man. And I was like, oh, that was just, that's just not good. Anyway, but what I think is most important is understanding children and the care of children, not every specific diagnosis that's in there, okay? Because if you understand the care of children, you can then extrapolate that out. Diabetes is diabetes, right? But uh, uh, you need to know that children don't understand the same way that adults do, and, it's, and that you have to change your teaching style. You, um, and you have to understand that children, because they're growing, their nutrition is very important, and so managing effective nutrition is much more important in a child than it is an adult. That kind of stuff. Keeping your blood sugar less than 120 is keeping your blood sugar less than 120 no matter who you are. So what, what you want to focus on when you're reading over these uh, pediatrics chapters is how is it, what is so special about the baby, about the child who has the disease? Not the disease itself, but what, what, is, what is the pediatric component that's important, okay? So we're going to run, a lot of these we're going to run pretty fast, and I'll just say, yeah, you know, like, um, uh, 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 I just want you to know the name of the disease, so that when you see intussusception on your NCLEX, you won't freak out, I've never even heard of intussusception. Okay, or if you see Tetralogy of Fallot, you'll know it's a heart defect. Okay, you don't have to know how to diagnose it and how to treat it. You just have to know that Tetralogy of Fallot is a heart defect that is deadly and it has to be fixed. Okay, and so a child with Tetralogy of Fallot is going to have some problems. That kind of stuff, okay? So let's see what we can do and see if we can cover as much of this as possible. I also, um, this first chapter is about care of the hospitalized child. I want to go kind of slow over that because understanding child development and understanding care of the hospitalized child, once you get those two things down, you can extrapolate out all the medical stuff that you're going to learn, that you learned in Adult Health 1 and I'm going to learn in Adult Health 2, and you can just change it to the pediatrics because you understand that children are different than adults. Make sense? All right. So, um, Health history is kind of the same for adults and for children, except you have to remember that you have two patients. You have the child and you have his parents, okay? And it's often the parents that are more trouble in pediatrics than the child. So remember, you have to establish a relationship with the parent and the family, okay? Um, uh, your standard medical information, right? Medical, social, immunizations, developmental milestones. Did the child meet all the milestones as appropriate? Was he crawling at a regular age? Was he talking at a regular age? That kind of stuff can give you a lot of hints when you're taking care of children who have issues. How does the child do it? You know, normal stuff. Does he sleep? Does he eat? Is he normal? And what's important to understand here is you have to know what's normal in order to know if the kid's normal, right? Mm -hmm. So we go back to developmental milestones. We go back to all the stuff we covered last week about how children act. You know, if a four-year-old isn't eating dinner with everybody else, is that normal or not normal? It's normal. Perfectly normal, because four-year-olds never eat, right? Because they're going through that negativity phase, that control of their environment phase. They want to control what they've got, and they're not going to eat. Plus, they like to run around like crazy, and they can't sit down to the dinner table like everybody, right? So it's not unusual for a four-year-old not to eat. And they very rarely starve themselves to death, and that's okay. All right? General review of systems. Pretty much the same as everything else, right? I'm not going to go over each of them specifically. Health assessment, anthropomorphic, anthropometric <coughs> measures. Yesterday, I taught, the, or last Friday, I taught the juniors how to do all these measurements on babies. Did anybody teach you guys that in your junior year? No. No? <laughs> okay. So when you're caring for a newborn, um, 
you want to make sure you want to know his weight and his length. Weight is pretty easy, right? You throw him on a scale, should measure him in grams, should be a, the same scale, should be a calibrated scale, right? Not his home scale with mom holding him and then try to figure out and then step off and put him down and put, step back up on the scale and try to you know do the math. That's not how you measure a newborn. You put them on an infant scale and you measure them in grams. The length is from the top of the head to the tip of the heel, and the best way to measure them is to lay him on a, lay him on a mattress with a, a sheet underneath him, stretch his leg out, make a mark on his heel, then make a mark at his head, and then move the baby out of the way and measure the difference between those two marks. That'll give you the length of the baby. All too often, people are trying to hold a tape at the top of his head, force the baby to lay straight all the way down and kind of, hold on kid, be still, will someone hold his knees? You don't have to do that. You can do it all by just making a mark at the top and the bottom and get him out of the way. Okay? Um, uh, we know what body mass index is, head circumference. You'll see here in the picture they're measuring head circumference. It goes right across the, the crown of the head, right across the top of the eyebrows, okay? Above the ears and above the eyebrows, and you measure that, okay? What's important is that you're always measuring the same spot and that your, your tape measure is, is, uh, is straight. You don't want it kind of co cocked at an angle so it's measuring around the base of his neck or the top of his neck and around his forehead, you need this really weird angle. You always want to be right across the top of the ears and top of the fore top of the eyebrows. Um, skin fold thickness, no one measures skin fold thickness. That's a body fat count thing. <laughs> the other thing that's important when you're measuring newborns is measuring his abdominal circumference and his chest circumference. The chest circumference you measure across the nipples, and the abdominal circumference you measure at the umbilicus. But remember, if they have a belly, uh, a belly if they have a, a an umbilical stump still, you're going to be right at the top of the umbilicus, okay, so that the belly button doesn't get in the way. You're right at the top of the circle, okay? And the reason why you want to measure chest circumference and abdominal circumference, anybody know? Like why it's important to measure them both together? They should be proportional? They should. They should be within a centimeter of each other. They should be very close. And that's important to know because you measure nipple circumference or chest circumference and abdominal circumference today and you get 29 and 28. Tomorrow, you measure it, you get 29 in the nipples and 32 in the belly. What does that mean? Something's distended. Exactly, he has abdominal distension. And what could it be? He's not pooping, he's constipated, he has Hirschsprung syndrome, he has um, um, uh, necrotizing intercolitis, he has an imperforate anus, there's all kinds of stuff it could be. So we measure that. Once they pass the newborn stage, we rarely bother with the, uh, the, the, the chest and abdominal circumference because um, they're usually pooping and peeing perfectly. We know if they have a problem by then. All right, vital signs, same as everyone else, but there's a little bit different. Do you see how they're taking his ear to his temperature? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do we use oral thermometers in toddlers? Mm -hmm. Not very often. They don't work very well, right? Mm -hmm. You can't get a two-year-old to hold a thermometer in his mouth. So if you don't have an oral thermometer, if you can't use an oral thermometer, ear therm thermometers work really well. They're very accurate. The important thing is to pull back on his ear. Okay. Um, so you straighten his ear canal. Okay. The, uh, uh, if you don't have an ear thermometer, what's another way you can take his temperature? Tympanic. Tympanic works well. They got those great things there. And axillary. And how do you take an axillary temperature on a baby? They do not like that. Who? Babies? Yeah. Yeah. They don't like you messing with them anyway. But, uh, but all you got to do, yeah. you don't do this, right? You want to put that, you want to lay it down along their body right here. Okay? So it kind of holds, the whole thing is covered. All right? You want to cover as much of the probe with his body as you can. Pulse? Do you put your hand on his wrist and measure his pulse? No. No, where do you measure a pulse on a, on a child? Brachial is wonderful for a newborn. Okay? Uh, how else can you do it? Femoral. Meh. You could, but the femoral pulse is really high, hard to get a hold of. The other one is to listen to his heart directly. Apical? Yeah. You can't get to the carotid because their necks are so, they have such tiny necks. It's hard to get in there, but you listen uh, to the, the heart rate specifically or a brachial pulse. I like the heart rate myself. Mm -hmm. And then blood pressure, of course, we'll take the blood pressure. We can take them on a newborn the same as we can anyone else, but blood pressures mean an awful lot to a newborn. Are we worried about high blood pressure in a newborn? No. No. no, we're worried about a difference. We tend to take blood pressures on all four limbs and compare the difference, okay? If it's higher on the right and lower on the left, that means something. It means that they've got a heart defect. Usually, a coarct of the aorta. Why would a coarct of the aorta cause a difference in the blood pressure? Anyone know what a coarct of the aorta is? It's a narrowing of the aorta right as it leaves the heart. Okay. 
And so the aorta is pinched off right as it leaves the heart. What does that mean to the body? What does it mean to the blood pressure on the left side of the body? What's that? Okay, but the heart, the, the blood pressure out after the coarct is going to be low, right? Because there's not a lot of blood making it out. But the coarct before, the blood pressure before the coarct is going to be very high as it's pushing against it, right? So they all have a very high right-sided pressure and a very low left-sided pressure. And that tells you that there's a blockage somewhere between the right and left arms, usually in the aorta. Fascinating, right? We're going to do the heart next week. And we'll talk about that more. Um, so, who can tell me what these fontanelles are? The spacing between the anterior and posterior yeah, fontanelle are spaces between the head. And why do we have these spaces? So they can go through the birthing canal. Right. Well, to allow them to make it through the birthing canal, but also to allow the head to grow as the brain grows, right? If there are babies born with fused fontanelles, and they have to have craniotomies to open their brain to enable to, their, their brain to grow as they get older. Um, but the fontanelles can be a sign of wellness. It can be used as a sign of wellness or illness in a baby. Anyone know anything about how that works? If they're like they're shrunken. Yep, exactly. A shrunken fontanelle would indicate what? Dehydration. Dehydration, right? And a bulging fontanelle would indicate? Swelling. What? Is it called like encephalopathy? Yeah, well, encephalopathy infection is a big one. Now, you have to make sure when you're measuring your fontanelles, the baby is relaxed. Okay, if he's crying, that fontanelle is going to bulge, and all so many new parents get so freaked out about it. The baby cries, they feel the bulging fontanelle. Oh, bulging fontanelle! And they run him into the emergency room. Well, of course he's got a bulging fontanelle. He's crying. Okay, but that's okay. It'll calm back down. Um, the uh, 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 how long it takes to the to close? It's usually within the first two years. That's why toddlers have such enormous heads. <laughs> <laughs> Eye assessment, we want to check them for visual acuity, ocular alignment, color blindness. All that stuff sounds familiar, right? Do we use the ABCD chart that we have out here? How do they test a baby? How do they test babies? They usually test them as like preschoolers. There's a little pictures. They think they have pictures, right? They have like an E and say which way is the E pointing, or more specifically, what do you see up there? I see a sailboat and a puppy and a you know that kind of thing, things that they can recognize. And then color blindness. They use color blindness. You've all been tested for color blindness, right? You look at the circle, it's got the green and the red, and you got it, yeah. How, how, how common is color blindness? You guys know? Very. Pretty darn common. Yeah, red, green, color blindness specifically, especially among males. Half of my children are, are color blind. What? Just a little. It's the yeah. rise of the cones or something, right? What's that? Oh, I don't know how it works. I just know that they can't tell the difference between red and green. No, it's the cones. Yeah. And it tend, they tend to grow out of it as they get older. They'll lose their, a lot of their color blindness. I was driving with someone. We, we didn't know the family, so they were driving us. And they, he's like, oh, I'm colorblind. And we all freak out. They, How do you read the sign? Like, the position. <laughs> well, don't the trick is that you know, red always looks red. Even if you can't tell the difference between red and green, you recognize that color as red. I mean, no. how do you guys know this is black? Because somebody told me it was Because somebody told you it was black, right? Mm -hmm. If this were red, but I told you your whole life it was black, you would look at it and say, well, that color red, what you think is red, is actually black, right? My brother can only see in shades of gray all of his colors. He sees everything in black and white. And so everything is black and white. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's, I know that that's green because that, that's what green looks like. You know, it looks like that but you put that green next to a, a piece of a gray that looks just like it, and he can't tell the difference. He'll pick out a gray and a green and go, they're the same color, because he only sees it black and white. Or so he claims. I've never been in his head. <laughs> okay. uh, ear assessments. Uh, you know, we do hearing, new, hearing assessment on newborns, of course. They put them in the hospital. They put them in. Do you guys ever ask how that works? No? Yeah. They're actually bouncing sound waves off the eardrum and seeing if it'll respond. Seeing if it can measure the vibration of the bones in the ear, and if the vibration, if the bones are vibrating in the ear, then the baby is hearing. Kind of cool, right? Um, the other thing that's important about ears: when you use an otoscope on a grown-up, how do you pull the ear? Up and back. Up and back. When you use an otoscope on a baby, how do you pull the ear? Back and down. Yep, straight back or back and down, right? Because the eustachian tube is a little bit of a different angle. <coughs> Oh, what a pretty membrane. 
Okay. I'm going to skip it. I'm going to move on. These aren't too terribly different. Um, big deals about this stuff. So, how do you check the genital urinary system of a newborn or of a, of a young child? Do you palpate? You, you palpate, right. And that's how you want to check the scrotum. Should have two testicles in the scrotum, right? If one is undescended, the kid might need, to, might need some attention. In the, at a, as a newborn, you have a couple of weeks for the testicle to descend. But if you've got a two-year-old with an undescended testicle, you might want to check into that, right? Mm -hmm. And do you know how you check, on, check a hernia? Look for an inguinal hernia in a, in a, in a male? In a, not, not necessarily in a newborn, but in a child who's like diaper age? What's that? You just grab his testicles. And, and you, you know, as he cries and squirms, it'll pop down. If it pops into the scrotum, uh, very often. Yeah. So inguinal hernias usually go, tend to go into the scrotum um, in the males. And the anus, you want to make sure it's patent. And it should all look basically alike, right? A vagina should look like a vagina. A testicle should look like a testicle. A penis should look like a penis. They should all look like what you're expecting to see. The urethra should open on the top of the glands the, in the male, and the urethra should open underneath the, the clitoral hood. Uh, or at the base of the clitoral hood in the female. Um, I, my experience has been that after they leave the diaper stage, we don't look at their testicles and their vagina all that much, okay? Um, until they reach, until they start to reach uh, adolescence. Ah, the child pain scale. Notice the difference. We do you ask a three-year-old on a scale of one to ten? How do you rate your pain? No. Use this one. And what's that called, by the way? You guys know? Faces. What? Faces. It's faces, but it's, it's like Whalian walks or something like that. Wong. There you go. Wong's faces. And you just kind of look at them. You know, which one makes you feel, which one is you? Like, you look at the kid and go, yeah, that one. He looks like that. I was at the emergency room the other yeah. day, like, with my husband, not in the pediatric. And I could hear the person next door, nurse or whatever she was. Well, is this the worst pain? And she's talking to an 18 month old or a two year old. Is this the worst pain you've ever felt in your entire oh, life? And I was God. like, I know you didn't just ask that kid that. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, right? You can't even get an 18 month old to point at one of these pictures, right? right? They don't understand it. You look at the 18 month old and go, yeah, that's the look on his face. Okay, that's where he is. Okay. Children with disabilities. So, <laughs> there's a whole chapter on children with disabilities we're going to talk about next week. Um, but uh, it's important to understand that the children with disabilities don't necessarily follow the same scale that, uh, that the other people do. And you have to really rely on the parents about where is this child and what can we use? What can we use to kind of base where, where he's going, right? I'm not going to go over all these slides with you. I hate slides like this, where it just runs and runs and runs. Too many words. All right. Now, let's talk about the different style. This, this, this pays a lot of attention to where you provide your care and how each one is a little bit different. Um, these are some of the settings that you'll see children in. Okay, so let's start with children in the hospital. Okay. Um, these are the most common reasons why children come into the hospital. Epistaxis, poisoning, and um, lead poisoning. Really? Common? Yeah. They're, they're still licking windows, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, the number, one, the number one poisoning for children is Tylenol. Okay? It's why we've, uh, uh, pediatricians have gone away from giving Tylenol. Mm -hmm. um, because parents tend to overdo it when it comes to Tylenol. Um, uh, children should have no more than one gram um, what is it? One. It's not one gram per kilogram. It's. Oh gosh, I, I used to have this formula in my head. I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. We'll come back. In adults, it's no more than six grams in a day. Well, no more than four grams in a day is safe. Um, for children, it's a much much smaller dose. All right. So when we're taking care of children in the hospital, um, it's. It, 
these are some of the ways that you can deal with it. You don't just take care of children like you take care of grown-ups, right? You have to, it helps, especially with young children, to make everything a game, to make it feel like they're not getting anything done, and yet they're getting an awful lot of things done, right? A wonderful way, for example, to, uh, to, to do IV draws or blood draws on children is to blow bubbles or have them blowing bubbles while you're doing the thing. And they'll kind of play with the bubbles and they'll get distracted and not pay as much attention to what you're doing. It actually works pretty well. Another good one is to give them um, um, sugary things for newborns. Give them something incredibly sugary, and it's 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 like a it's like a narcotic. You can give them that, and you, just, you can do pretty much whatever you want to them if you give them a little few drops of sugar. They have this. Uh, you guys have you guys seen in the newborn nurseries? Are they yeah. using that dexy, yes. dextrose liquid? They use it in the PPD, it's like this little purple container. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You get it, start an IV on like a two week old, and uh -huh. use that. Yep. And they just kind of go out once you give them a lot of sugar. It's a pretty neat trick. Um, what do you think they mean when they talk about therapeutic play? Oh, that's um, what could be like that. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> therapeutic play, yeah. Well, it's where you use play to help uh, guide your to, to help guide your uh, your things. Like um, uh, uh, a lot of children, and same thing with role modeling. A lot of children will use like trucks, and they'll put their emotions into the trucks. And so they can, they'll talk about like the trucks, it's sad, you put an abused kid and give him trucks and the mommy truck will argue with the daddy truck and the daddy truck, no, you're a barrel and you'll hit him with and that kind of stuff. And the kid's using the trucks to express his emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Or sexual abuse too, because don't you generally have a word, you know, you give them a doll. Yeah, they'll have them draw pictures or give them a doll. Where on the doll did you, where you touch, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Understanding that their language isn't, um, they don't have the same language skills that we do, so they have trouble describing things. They have trouble using abstract uh, images, and so you give them something concrete, like a doll or a truck or something like that, and say, show me what happened, and then they can, they can act it out and play it out. Okay? So parents. Parents are uh, often the troublemaker when it comes to pediatrics. Not necessarily the parents are bad people, but parents are harder to take care of than the, than the children. And why would parents of a child who has RSV or an asthma attack or need a craniotomy, why would they be difficult to deal with? Because they don't understand what's going on and they can't control the situation. There you go. They don't understand and they can't control and they're frightened. Yeah. Okay? People who are frightened tend to lash out, tend to get angry, tend to respond fairly negatively, okay? And so it's, it's, parents require some kid gloves. Um, you want to uh, talk to them about the needs, talk uh, debriefing them about what ha what's going to happen and what, what just happened. You want to talk about their advice. What do, you, what do you do with your child when you need them to get something done, right? Um, and communicating between the nurse and the family members uh, uh, should be open and honest. Um, and, 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 and try to use your resources as well as you can. It's a bad idea to say, well, that's just the way it happens. Because uh, parents get very upset, very frustrated at that. We, we, you see it all the time in the medical field, and we just kind of, we, we just kind of gloss over it. You know? <clears throat> like, well, you're just going to do it the way I said it. Well, parents hate that, okay? Because parents are in control, and they don't like to be out of control, and they're frightened, and they want you to explain to them what's going on with their child. These are basic care things uh, for um, how, to, how to bathe a child. So these are the bath rules. Okay, what do you do at home? When and do you you don't put a baby in a bathtub, right? You put a baby in a very shallow portable tub. Um, if you've ever given the best way, you can't you can't do this as nurses. But what I teach my parents when they go home to bathe the baby is sit in the bathtub yourself and put the baby on your lap and bathe the baby on your lap, oh, it works wonderful. But since we're nurses and we don't get to take a bath with other people's newborns, we, we use portable tubs, right? Nice, shallow, portable tub. What a lot of hospitals use is the sink, the plain old hand-washing sink, yeah. you know? Um, That's perfect. Uh, we used to say no, never give a baby a, a submersion bath until after the umbilical cord has fallen off, mm -hmm. but nowadays we don't worry about that too much anymore. We realize it's not gonna cause any problems anyway. But um, we, it works well to submerge the baby uh, uh, with, uh, like the nipples exposed, but not, but the, only the nipples and the face exposed, and so that they can stay warm. And nice warm water, not too hot, only about 100 degrees. Obviously never leave the child alone. An awful lot of babies 
drown, especially at home, when they're left alone for the parents, okay? Um, in, 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 I teach parents never to take their eyes or their hands off their newborn, off their child, until they're old enough to, build, to blow bubbles, okay? When a baby's old enough to blow bubbles in the bathtub, then he's old enough that you can, ta you can take your eyes off him for a second, but only for a second. But I'd never leave a child alone in the bathtub. That means don't leave the child alone to go answer the phone. Don't leave the child alone to go answer a call bell. Don't leave the child alone because someone's ringing on the, on the doorbell. Never leave a child alone. Never take your eyes or your hands off the baby. And that means that if I have to find something under the sink in the bathroom, I have my hand on the baby or I take him out of the, bath, out of the water to go get whatever I need. Okay? Um, Sometimes it can be useful to let the parent, to have the parents do the bath and then watch what they do when they're given the bath. Watch them in an unobtrusive manner so they don't really focus on the fact that they're being washed, watched and see how they do. Uh, observing is the same thing as any other skill. You give a baby, you give someone a skill, you observe how they do it so you can help correct them for little problems. Okay? And baths are fun for kids, especially for toddlers. And so it's a wonderful way to get to know the nurse is by bathing them and playing games in the bathtub and that kind of thing. And it can help them develop a sense of trust. Feeding, I think we talked an awful lot about feeding, but these are some specific rules. What's really important when we talk about formula feeding um, is that the baby does not need more than 32 ounces of formula in a day, okay? The average newborn, uh, the average child under the age of six usually eats about 27, uh, 24 to 27 ounces a day. Um, and that's a normal amount. If you've got a kid who's eating an eight ounce bottle every two to three hours, there's something wrong with how you're feeding that kid, okay? Um, and the older a child, you're gonna look for food preferences. Um, you're going to, uh, 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 and then these are some basic calories that, you're gonna, that you, you want, might wanna pay attention to. Rest, make sure they get plenty of rest. Children need to sleep an awful lot. Let them sleep in in the hospital. Don't wake them up at random hours. You know, people need their rest. They're in an, they're in an unfamiliar situation and they, need, they, need to, to, they don't need to follow our rules as well as they do, you know, older, older children or older people. And remember that all children need naps probably until they're about eight or nine years old, especially in a hospital, okay? Watch your safety measures. Um, cribs, we use cribs in hospitals. They, have, they actually look more like cages, okay? <laughs> so the children can't keep out of them. Uh, keep watch out for your toxic, uh, toxic stuff. Watch your, your chemicals. Um, child identity is very, very important. The children should have bracelets on just like the grown-ups. And you need to always check your identity bands, okay? What do you think they mean when they talk about transporting children safely? Let's talk about newborns. How do you transport a newborn? In a bassinet. Always in a bassinet, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then in older children, when they need to move them around, like toddlers who are too small to ride in wheelchairs, they actually can move the cribs around and stuff. Um, okay. These are all common sense things, right? When you're using restraint devices, make sure that they work, right? Keep everything in the lowest position to the ground, locked strapped in, right? Um, just like, uh, you know, it, it's uh, um, just like you would at home. One of my rules is I never allow parents to put the, uh, the uh, um, what are those things called? You carry them in a, in a car, the car seat? Oh, the car seat. Yeah, you know how they have those car, car care, infant carrier car seats? Mm -hmm. They always want to put them up here. And I instantly take them and put them on the ground. Okay, always want to keep the baby as close to the ground or in your arms as possible. Okay, so if the mother's, if someone's not holding the baby, they need to be on the ground in a car seat or whatever, because uh, the car seat, the little handle thing, does not an effective roll cage. Okay, and when it falls from here, it's going to fall down, and the baby's going to get hurt. Okay, so we always want to keep the car seats as close to the ground as we can at all times. Those little um, bouncy things that they sit in that are on like a, they're like a little angle shape, and the kid bounces when they kick them. People always want to put them on the kitchen table. No, they go on the ground. My mom okay. put mine on the counter and I threw myself off the counter. Exactly, because they bounce and they move and next thing you know they're gone. And one thing I warn a lot of parents about is, well that explains it, right? Yeah, 
But one thing I, I tell people all the time is your baby will roll over an awful lot faster mm -hmm. than you think he will. Parents out here, how many of you have let your child roll off the bed? How many of you? I know I did. Yeah. No one's going to admit it, huh? No one's child ever fell off a bed. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. My son, who was like 10 weeks old, took a stitch in the lip. 10 weeks old, who knew he could roll? He rolled right off the bed and hit his, hit his lip on the way down. Okay? They will always roll faster than you expect them to. So again, if the baby's not on the floor where he can't get hurt, always have your hand or your eyes on the child. Don't you know, change in the diaper and go, oh, I need something over here, and leave him to fall four feet. Okay, That's a long way to fall when you're a newborn. Medication administration. Can you give a two-year-old a pill? No. no. No, of course you can't. They're not going to take pills very well. They don't take pills well as, you know, as late as seven or eight years old. They're still struggling with pills. So how do we give them oral medications? Syringe. Syringe, syringes or teaspoons, but it's liquids, right? And so it's important to make sure that the medications are age appropriate. Now, my daughter, when she had ALL, she, uh, she had to learn how to take pills. She was five years old, and she was taking 23 pills a day. Okay? And you know how we taught her how to take pills? Baby M&Ms. It was perfect. We, had her, we, gave her, we got a big old bag of baby M&Ms, and we'd have her practice taking them. And she'd suck it, and then she'd bite it, and we're like, okay, now you have to swallow it without biting it. And she learned how to do that, and take a little glass of water and do that. And then soon we had her taking five or six M&Ms at a time, and swallowing it, and then eventually we just went to regular M&Ms and had her learn how to do regular M&Ms. Sure, sure enough, by the time she had been a month or two of chemotherapy, she was a pill-taking master. She got to where she could literally take 23 at a time. <laughs> what liquid from her captopurulene? They don't exist. Why not? They just don't. Yep. Yep. So what they do if they don't have pills available and you've got little babies, is they crush them in a mortar and pistol and mix them with water and then take them. But we were like, ah, we don't need to worry about that. We'll teach her how to take pills. We're nurses. So that was our trick is we gave her M&Ms. So we taught her how to take pills with M&Ms. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it works really well. But if you can't get a, a child to take a pill, you can always crush them. And maybe, now, they don't generally recommend crushing them and mixing them in with, like, the applesauce or something. And why not? What's that? Because they, they may not eat all the applesauce, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you mix it in with the applesauce and they only eat half of it, then what do you do? And then how do you know how much you gave them or didn't give them? Right? So if you're going to mix it with something, it's usually they mix it with a little water and just squirt it in their mouth directly. So they just grind it up real well, dissolve it in water, and squirt it right in their mouth. Now? Well, they do that to VA, but it's not that much applesauce. It's like it's too small. Right, very, very little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For grown ups, you need. Yeah, it's easier for grown-ups, I think. Because well, you can convince a yeah. grown-up, oh, it's one teaspoon, you can do it. It's hard to force a teaspoon or you know, an ounce of applesauce down a two-year-old's mouth if they won't take it. Once an adult, twice a child. Well, I guess you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, they talk about administering medications to the infant may require additional assistance. What do you think they're talking about there? <coughs> the taste bag. I mean, like they mean they they. When I read that, I always think that they mean that they're holding the kid down, yeah. you know, like forcing him to take it. You know, I'm not the force kind. I would never force anybody to take anything. I gotta trick. I gotta figure out a way to treat to trick them into it. Yeah. Okay. I have always hated when I would watch people. They come in and they're like, "My child won't take a shot. You gotta hold him down and fight him to the ground." And like, how traumatic is that? How awful. You know, and, and the other one that I really hate is when people bring their children in for their appointments and like mom has the appointment and they bring the children in and they say, you better be, you know, better be nice or he'll give you a shot. Mm -hmm. I hate that. I don't want that kid afraid of me. No. Why do I want that kid afraid of me thinking that he's going to get a shot every time he comes to see somebody with a long white coat? I always correct him and say, please don't tell him that. <laughs> if he doesn't behave, I'll kick him out of the room, sure. But I'm not going to give him a shot. I'm not going to be mean and cause pain to the kid. So... It's important when you're working with children to, to, to always try to be positive around the medical care, never negative. Okay? I guess there are, advanced, there are times when they absolutely need it, but those times should be avoided at all costs. When my four-year-old got bitten by a dog, 
He had to take 29 stitches across the face. And the doctor was going to use a papoose wrap on him and, and put the stitches in. Anyone know what a papoose wrap is? Yeah, yeah papoose. You were papoosed? Do you remember it? Yeah, I was too young. But, no? uh, but I, I don't know if it's stems or just think I'm just weird. I don't like being bound. Yeah. Like, I, like when I can't, like the people... Like, my brother-in-law likes to take my legs, and so uh -huh. I can't move, and I freak out. Exactly. Like, it freaks me out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't like papoose wraps. What's that? I had to do it to my niece to, uh -huh. to get an IV on her. Yeah. She was sick, which y'all all know the story. Yeah. That's Christmas, but it's, it's very, very traumatic. It's very traumatic on the child, and I do not use it. You know, um, most, a papoose wrap is a board with, with the Velcro straps that kind of come out. And they put the child on the board, and they wrap him up, and then they put the Velcro around him real tight so he's completely restrained, and he can't move at all. Okay? And then they can do horrible things to the child. It's just and, like a psychological... Yeah, it's a great job. <laughs> it's restraints, right? And we can't put restraints on grown-ups. I don't like using restraints on children. There, you know, there might be reasons if they're really in trouble. When my kid needed, needed 29 stitches, I said, there is no way you're going to tie him to the bed and then just put stitches in him until he stops screaming. Okay, that's just not going to happen. You're going to sedate him. And they're like, oh, we can't sedate him. Yes, you can. I know you can sedate him. <laughs> I'll even show you how if you need help. <laughs> You're going to sedate that child. We'll have to start an IV. Yes, you will. And he's going to sleep peacefully through the, through the procedure, and he'll be fine afterward. Okay? And so they sedated him. They put stitches in his face. And it was really funny. When we woke him up, he got up, and he went to the bathroom, and he stopped in the mirror and went... What happened to my face? Because he had the stitches. He thought he had spiders all over his face. <laughs> and he was all puffy and swollen, the poor kid. He was a mess. But the important thing is, I really am against holding somebody down and forcing him to do things. You have to be more creative than that as a peds nurse. Okay? Um, these are wonderful ways of doing it. Cuddling. Oh, yeah. You put the kid in mom's arms and have him just cuddle in love, you can get away with almost anything, okay? Especially things that are painful. Another great one is to put him to the breast. You can do heel sticks all day long, the kid won't even notice you're there, as long as he's on the breast. Same reason that the sugar thing works. Because what is human milk but the sweetest of all uh, mammalian milks, right? Remember that the medication isn't punishment. We don't want to teach kids that, that, uh, that any medical care is ever punishment. Okay? There's another one. Be patient and allow, allow for the idea that, they, that the kids are going to have questions, especially adolescents. How do, why do adolescents ask so many questions? What's that? Because they want to know, sure, because they want to be in control, right? They want to figure out what's going on. Some of them are downright curious. Others are just downright obstinate. And they're going to ask questions because they, because they just want to be mean. Okay? Remember, right patient, right medication, right dose, right route, right time, and right documentation. I've never seen that sixth route right oh, yeah. before. Yeah. Is that new? Okay. Well, I don't know if you guys before. Not to you guys? No. Yeah. New to me, it used to be five rights. It used to be no rights. <laughs> then we, we made them up right around, the, right around the 2000, 2001. There you go. You come a long way, baby. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about fever-reducing measures. Are fevers a good thing for children or a bad thing for children? They do, right? They kind of help them. It's the body's response, but they can be maladaptive as well. And as a general rule, they'll get better whether they have a fever or don't have a fever. So in general, we like to control fevers. But fevers are extremely common in children, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like an adult has a fever, we know there's something wrong with you. Children have a fever all the time. And we just want to keep them manageable. You know, under 102 is a good idea, you know. Um, and the ways you can do it, of course, are antipyretics. Giving Tylenol works really well most of the time. But remember, you can only give them so much Tylenol in a day. All right, so you can't give them Tylenol every couple hours to keep their fever down. How about some non-pharmacologic non fever reduction techniques? Like if they have a layers of clothes. There you go. Going back to our different types of heat loss in newborns, right? We can take off some clothes, expose some skin to air. We can even give them like a, a alcohol bath. Mm -hmm. Why alcohol? Because it evaporates so yeah. quickly, right? And an alcohol bath, you put alcohol in your skin, it always feels real cold. Mm -hmm. 
okay? Because it evaporates so quickly, so it cools them that way. Or just a tepid bath, a bath that's not a 98 degree bath, you know? Not a cold bath, you don't want to soak them in ice cubes, but you want to give them, you know, give them a little water that's less than the temperature they are, so that they'll feel, um, so that they'll cool off a little bit, right? Emotional support? Um, what do you think it means to be in the moment? Be like actively like in the moment, like not have your mind on something else. Okay. More important, how about the kid's mind on something else? What it means is you can't tell a child who's three years old, we're gonna do this and then later we'll play. Mm -hmm. Okay? They don't understand and then later we'll play. Remember, they're still very concrete. Right. They're still very much right now. All right. So you 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 have to un, you have to exp um Explain to them while you're doing it what you're doing, and then immediately afterward cuddle and comfort and support. Okay, so yes, I have to do this horrible thing, and I'm very sorry that I have to do this horrible thing. There, it's all over now. Come here, let me give you a hug. I'm so sorry I had to do that, right? That kind of thing. Not, you know, you can't explain to a five year old that if they take their Mercaptor Perline every day, where they'll live to see the age of 20. They don't understand what that means, right? They don't understand I'm doing this to get better or in the long run. They just that they have to be very much in the moment, okay? And you can talk about how it, you know, how, um, how you know, you have to take your medicines so that you can be a healthy kid, okay? That, and you could even mention the fact that if you take this medicine, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be a big, strong, healthy grown-up later on. But they don't really understand what it means to be a big, strong, healthy grown-up because they haven't the ability for abstract reasoning. Okay, they'll even repeat it to you, but they don't really know what they're saying, right? Like my daughter who was freaked out by tonsillectomy when she, was, she would rather have methotrexate for the treatment of leukemia. She had no concept of what it meant to, to, to have her tonsils taken out or what it meant in the long term if she took methotrexate or didn't take methotrexate. She never understood what dying meant and she never even entered her head that she could have died, right? Because death is such an abstract thought to a six-year-old, they can't even comprehend it. Okay? So being in the moment means that. Paying attention to the child right now. Okay? A caring attitude. Listen to what they have to say, even if you think they're speaking gibberish. Listen to what they have to say because it's comforting to be able to express yourself. Okay? Clarify misconceptions. My favorite story. I, had a little, um, um, I heard the story once. I don't know if it was true or not, but it's so sweet. I love to tell it. There was a little girl who was sick, and she needed a blood transfusion. And her brother matched, uh, matched her. So they were going to draw blood, they were going to like donate blood um, and, and give it to the little girl. And when they started draw, donating, drawing the little boy's blood, he was very, very, very quiet and very um, serious, you know, while his sister was ready for the blood transfusion. And he kept asking questions, well, how long is it going to take? Only a few minutes, okay. Well, how, what, 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 you know, what's going to happen afterward? Well, you know, well, you were going to give the blood to your sister, okay. And then finally, um, one of the nurses asked, you know, why are you uh, asking me so many questions? And what, it, what he thought he was doing was giving his blood to his sister. So he would die and his sister would live. And so he thought that he was dying and that he was sacrificing for his sister. That's why, how long is it going to take? What's going to happen afterward? All that stuff. Isn't that sad? Someone didn't explain well. I'm like, oh, poor guy. What a brave little kid, right? I'm going to die so my sister can live. Oh. <laughs> okay. And helping families develop coping strategies. Um, it's very important to understand that when you have a sick child, especially a chronically sick child, everything changes. Okay. Um, as the father of a chronically of a formerly chronically sick child, I recognize that an awful lot. I was in grad school, I was studying, and, I, and uh, I had, you know, my whole life got, got put on hold. And you know, we had other children to deal with. And my wife and I were really freaked out for the first week. Okay? And then we, uh, uh, we, we went, uh, my, one of my professors came and watched Emily so we could go out to dinner and talk. 
When we went to Cheesecake Factory and we started talking, we said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of, being, of, of having this grief. I'm sick and tired of, of, of thinking that you know, Emily's going to die. This is all going to knock. We're going to knock it off right now. Well, I can't roll into a ball and turn into a quivering pile of jello. I just can't. Tomorrow that, you know, is another day and we have children to take care of. And so we very quickly realized that no matter what happened, we were going to continue on with our lives. We had to. We had six other children to take care of. Right? And so, um, so we, because we're both nurses, we're very rational people, we were able to figure that out. But most parents with children um, who are chronically ill take a little bit longer to develop their coping skills. And everybody's coping skills are different. And what you need to do, just like with adults, with any other adult, is figure out where their strengths and weaknesses are. What have they done in the past to deal with stressful situations? How can, I, how can we employ those strategies now? That kind of thing. How can we answer your questions so that you can understand it? How, do you, how are you going to get back and forth to the hospital? How are you going to deal with your other children? And kind of work through the various things that they need to help them develop coping skills. Understanding that chronic illness is a huge source of grief for parents whose children have them. Okay? They struggle an awful lot with the idea that they've lost their perfect child. That their child is never going to be the way other children are going to be. Okay? That they're going to be different. Um, asthma is not so bad, diabetes is really is kind of bad, cystic fibrosis is horrible, and it continues to get worse, you know. Um, so understand, parents need to develop coping skills, okay. Informed consent, uh, who, who needs the informed consent in, a child, in pediatrics? Do you get informed consent from the five-year-old? No. No, from the parents, right? So informed consent is given to is is gotten from the parents, but you should definitely explain it to the child so that the child's on board with the plan if you can, at all if it's at all possible. And one trick for parenting: never add, offer a child something that you can't give them. Okay, okay. You only offer them what his actual options are. Okay. Not do you want to take the shot? Because the answer is no. Then you're hosed, right? Yeah. It's how do you want to do this? You know, we're going to do this. How do you want to do it? There are several techniques we can use. This is lunch. You have the choice between macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. Which one are you going to have? Don't ask them what they, what they want for lunch because you don't have it. Okay? Don't, offer, don't ever offer a child anything that, you don't, that you're not actually willing to give them because they'll always choose it and then you're screwed, right? So pay attention to that. The legal age. For most states, the legal age is 18, okay? However, we do allow, especially in the realm of uh, reproductive um, uh, medicine, we allow that to kind of go down a little bit. Um, uh, uh, it's, and then... Um, like 16? What's that? Like 16 is usually a fair number. But once a, once a woman gets pregnant, no matter how old she is, what does she become? An emancipated minor is what they're called, okay? They are, now, they are now able to consent for their own stuff. Once they turn 13 years old and they're pregnant, they're an emancipated minor. And then we have to negotiate with the, with the parents and the kid together. What we usually do with our really young teenagers who get pregnant is we don't tell them they're an emancipated minor. We just recognize that they are and we let them go that way. Because most 13-year-olds are pretty content to let their mom and dad make decisions for them, especially if they don't realize they had the decisions in the first place. Because okay. a 13-year-old is not really cognizant of making those choices. Being pregnant doesn't all of a sudden make them 25. <laughs> Legally, they're, they're an adult, but they're really not. Okay. Common procedures. We use IVs for, to fix these problems. Dehydration is a major source of illness in children. Uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the number one source of hospitalization for children in America is dehydration. Okay, and or is uh, is diarrhea, and they're di they're admitted for diarrhea because they're dehydrated, right? Mm -hmm. So fluid maintenance and replacement, um, we also use them um, like for diagnostic testing, like when we're going to use contrast studies, mm -hmm. just like we would in a grown up. All these things are the same. See, this is what frustrates me. Do we really need a list of why you would ever use an, an IV on any human being? No. <laughs> Other types. It's, they have the exact same ones that grown-ups have. Okay. Uh, monitoring intake and output, no different in children than it is in grown-ups, but it's particularly important with children who have cardiac or respiratory illness. Okay. 
X-rays, exactly, exactly the same. Specimen collection. How do you collect urine in a child wearing a diaper? A hat. Wave a diaper. No, collect the urine. Oh, what are you saying? Oh, it's yeah. really like bags. Yeah. There you go. They have urine bags. They have yeah. these little sticky bags that you put over the genitals, and when the baby pees, it pees into the bag. And then you can take them off. And they always leak, and they work horribly, but they keep at least something out of the diaper that you can send down the lab to be evaluated. Yeah. Okay? But if you're going to measure urine output, of course, that's when you weigh the diaper. Okay. There's a picture of the urine bag. And then, what are we doing, bless you, what are we doing over here? Test? Yeah, just throat swab. Oh, okay. Same thing. There should be two, right? What's that? There should be two. What, two what? Two Q-tips. Oh, you're doing the rapid strip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. This is just a regular throat culture. It's just a regular Q-tip, and it goes into a, into a sterile bin, and then they take it down to microbiome. It's a different test than the rapid strip. You know a great trick if you're going to throb, swab someone's throat? Have them breathe out hard when you touch the back of their throat, and they don't gag. You put the tongue blade on there, and you take a look, and you go, okay, when, you, when, I, when I say go, I want you to breathe like that, really hard, and go. And you swab them while they do that, and they don't gag. Most of the time. What's that? My, my, my patient, I, I felt bad because I really want to make sure I got a good swab, and I did, but he was like... Yeah, but I got him a toy. Yeah. I was like, well, there I'm you so go. Sorry. I was like, you can't like, Little kids, it's hard to tell them to swab, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. his tongue, like, every single time I put the tongue depressor down and put it down, it's like he would block the back. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. NG tubes on newborns? Mm. I think this is just like you do on grown ups mm -hmm. from nose to ear to xiphoid process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've never done any T2, um, NG tube on a, on a grown-up. Restraining the child? Okay. So, um, we talked about how much I hate restraints. Right? It may be necessary, but it really shouldn't be. Um, you want to check them every 15 minutes. And make sure, just like in an adult, you're paying very close re re uh, attention to it. I would, for, personally, I prefer pharmaceutical restraints because they're not so traumatizing. If I have to do something mean to a kid, I'd rather knock him out first and then do it. Okay? I'm going to skip and skip. You guys can read these things all yourself. Okay. More and more, school nursing is becoming incredibly important. And why is that? What do, what do school nurses do? When I was a kid, the school nurse was there because you had a fever. She'd give you some Tylenol, let you take a nap, and see if you felt better. But what do school nurses do today? Everything. They are regular primary care nurses taking care of children with developmental needs, children with, with medications, because no children are allowed to stay out of school anymore. So even kids who are cognitively incapable of understanding school go to school. Okay? Mm -hmm. I have a little girl that I teach, uh, that we have in our Sunday school. She's the age of a seventh grader, but mentally there's nothing there. Okay? She, she opens her eyes and she interacts with the environment, but she can't speak. She's relatively spastic. She has brain injury from a, a surgery that she had very, very young in life. And so she's, you know, she's got severe brain damage, severe mental retardation. But she goes to school every day. <laughs> and it's more, if, if anything, there's socialization there. They can do physical therapy there. And it gives the parents a little respite. But that means that school nurses have to give her her medications during the day. It's school nurses that are accessing her peg tube and putting medicine in her peg tube. Because uh, that, that, and so um, some of you may become school nurses. There's a wonderful job for you out there, um, uh, but you're, they spend an awful lot of time taking care of uh, developmentally disabled children, where they never did in the past. It's a lot like home health care. Okay, so it's important to understand that school care is changing an awful lot. But the other side to school nursing is that we can facilitate normal development where possible, we can socialize children, and we can use, we can send children who used to spend prolonged times in the, in the hospital, we can send them home and have them go to school and get a little bit of nursing care while they're in school. And they can at least try to get back into the normal life over time. Okay. The other part about that, intervening with actual or potential health problems. When um, you guys may have, well, 
home care providers who are not trained nurses don't often recognize the subtle signs of, of trouble, okay? You hear about it all the time, especially with old people. They have these horrible bed sores, they're not being turned, they get infections and people aren't taking their, their home care providers. They mean well, they're just not trained to take care of them, right? Same thing with children, as happens with old people, that this child could be having you know, minor issues at home turning into big problems. And if they're never involved with a healthcare provider, the family doesn't notice it until they get sick, and then they go, oh, that bed sore is why she's septic. Whereas if they're coming to school being seen by nurses on a regular basis, we can early, intervene a little earlier and try to prevent problems before they become you know, life-threatening. Okay. They can collaborate with other healthcare professionals, work with case management, yada, 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 and advocate for the children. Okay? Uh, same thing. Same thing. Look at that, how fast we go. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about allergies and, uh, um, and allergic and infectious disease. Okay? I thought I'd start with anaphylaxis. What is anaphylaxis? Allergic infection. Yeah. Severe, life-threatening, allergic reaction, uh, generally where the throat is closing and they're stopping, they're, they stop breathing, okay? Um, most of the time when people say they're allergic to something, they're not actually allergic like this, right? <laughs> that they get, I get a rash when I take penicillin, you're not allergic to penicillin, okay? You just get an uncomfortable side effect from it, okay? And most of the things are that. Um, the idea is that it might someday turn into an anaphylactic reaction, but most of the people who say they're allergic, you'll find very quickly as a nurse, they're not actually allergic to anything. I've had women say they're allergic to Benadryl, I'm allergic to vitamin C, and you know, what happens when you take Benadryl? I fall asleep. <laughs> That's the therapeutic effect. I'm allergic to vitamin C. What happens when you take vitamin C? My mouth is sore when I eat oranges and pineapples and stuff. Well, no joke. You just go, seriously. Okay, fine. Whatever you think. Okay. But anaphylaxis is life-threatening to children. Why? Because they don't know they're allergic until, they ex until they're exposed to it, right? Um, and the, a lot of the things that kids are becoming allergic to are fairly common. For example, peanuts you know, and nut products are extremely common. We love our peanut butter in America, right? And the other thing is that some of these things like peanuts, chocolate, strawberries, things that are really uh, allergy-producing are things that kids like to eat. And so they'll cheat. Maybe I can have a little bit of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then they have an anaphylactic reaction. Okay? Anaphylaxis is only dangerous outside the hospital. Doctors in ICU, they don't care about anaphylaxis. They're like, I can cause anaphylaxis because I can treat it. But what I need to do is get you this penicillin. Okay? One of our internal medicine docs at the hospital says that all the time. He's like, yeah, I know he's allergic to penicillin, but guess what? Penicillin is the cure. So I'm going to give him penicillin, and I'll innovate him if I need to. <laughs> as, long as, I can, as long as I can treat his infection, I don't mind, I'm in the ICU. Okay? Because he, you know, the point is that he can handle it. Anaphylaxis is dangerous when you can't handle it. Okay? So fal fatalities occur due to respiratory compromise, cardiovascular collapse, um, which, almost all, which comes after the respiratory compromise. Okay? Um, yeah, I'll get off track. <laughs> The major symptoms include wheezing and tachycardia as the throat starts to swell or starts to close, that narrowed airway makes them whistle, okay? And that whistling sign is trouble. And then after whistle, wheezing and tachycardia comes the hypotension, cyanosis, and altered level of consciousness. But those three side effects are not the anaphylaxis. Those three side effects are the fact that he can't breathe. <laughs> he can't get enough oxygen, everything else is going to start to go down, right? All these things, you know, swelling around the nose and the face, anxiety. Why would they be getting anxiety? Because they can't breathe. Because they can't breathe. It all revolves around the swell, around the can't breathe, right? Mm -hmm. Hives and urticaria are system, systematic issues. I've never seen anyone with nausea and vomiting from an anaphylaxis, but okay. Abdominal pain, laryngospasming, sense of impending doom comes along with the cardiovascular collapse. I would say, yeah. Okay. Now, does anyone know anything about allergy testing? How they do it? They do a little needle on your back. Yeah, lots of little needles. What they do is they, they, they pick a spot, it could be on the arm or on the back, whatever, or on the chest, a spot where they can see a lot, and they'll, uh, they'll prick them, expose them to like 20 or 30 different allergens at the same time, and then they see which ones respond. 
Okay, and so they go, oh, well, they've got a response to strawberries, and you've got a response to dog hair, and got a response to peanuts, and, and that's how they do allergy testing. Okay. Uh, I guess they're, they're talking here about the difference between anaphylaxis and oral allergy syndrome. Um, some people are going to get swelling. I had a friend who was allergic to chocolate, but he absolutely loved chocolate. And so what he would do is he'd eat the chocolate yeah. and have it, and he'd go, I'm starting to swell. And his lips would start to swell, and he'd go, yeah, take some Benadryl and another piece of chocolate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And so he doesn't have anaphylaxis, he just has oral, um, oral allergy syndrome, right? Where he gets a tingling in the palate and the nose and the lips, and he starts to swell a little bit but it doesn't stop breathing, okay? And that's the important thing, okay? Immediate care is, the emer is activating the emergency system, providing an open airway, plain old supportive ABCs, just like we would on anybody else, um, and then epinephrine. Anyone ever seen anyone carrying an EpiPen? <laughs> yeah, we use them in the Army all the time, these EpiPens. Uh, we carry them around all the time. By the way, you guys, because you're nurses, you are qualified to give EpiPen. If you were not a nurse and you were at a uh, Boy Scout function and a kid had got, got, got uh, started having anaphylaxis, would the parents be able to give an EpiPen? Only that kid's parents, not the scout leader. Okay. In scouting and all the other, in most other places, we say that if the kid carries an EpiPen, the kid has to give it to him himself, or the parent has to give it to him. Otherwise, unless you know how to give shots, you don't give EpiPens. My okay. mom has to go through training, like all the teachers and stuff have to go through training, so they're oh, yeah. able to give happy So they're qualified to do it, makes good sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I found out recently, either I'm not allergic to bees, or bees and hornets are not the same. Did I tell you guys I got stung? I found a hornet's nest. Yes. Yeah, I got stung 11 days. times. <laughs> Again? No, it was a couple oh. weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. That's a good I killed all those bastards, horrible. they're not coming back. <laughs> Kill him with fire. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Kill him with fire. <laughs> no, they have these really cool um, hornet's nest killers. It shoots like 25 feet. Right. Yeah. So you could go here and hit the, t hit the tree. And that was pretty nice. I was like, die, you bastard. <laughs> 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 it's, it shoots that? a long ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's a foam. Oh, it shoots oh, a foam oh. out. Yeah. I thought you like had a fire. I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. That's the thing of Now let's talk about the epidemiologic triangle, okay? Um, are you guys familiar with this triangle? Host, environment, and agent, right? So and this is very important for children because they go through this over and over and over again. Children are a, are a susceptible host. Why are children a susceptible host? Okay, because they're nasty, sure, right? Because everything goes right in the mouth, and they'll pick their boogers and eat their boogers and clean out the ear, and, right? So kids tend to be a little bit nasty. What else is wrong with kids? Their immune system is not quite... Exactly, they haven't developed their immune system, right? You guys are alert, are, are rubella immune because you were given immunizations, right? You guys are immune to an awful lot of childhood diseases because you already had them, right? The average three, four, five-year-old hasn't had them yet, and so they have to get them. And so children get a, uh, there is a host of childhood illnesses that children get, and every single time they do it, they get a little stronger, a little bit more immune to something else. So they have to develop the immunity. And we tend to say that you can't kill an old kindergarten teacher or peds nurse, because they're immune to everything. Because they've had everything. The first few years of teaching elementary school, the teachers are sick constantly for the first three to five years, and then they stop being sick anymore because they're immune to everything. Same thing with healthcare providers, same thing with nurses. You'll find once you start exposing yourself to these, uh, these viruses, you're going to get sick over and over and over again, and then you're going to stop being immune. To, you're going to start being immune to it. And so it starts in infancy. They need to get these sicknesses so that they can develop this immunity. Because in childhood, everything's running so hot and fast, they get over them pretty darn quickly. So they're a susceptible host. Okay. Um, and the means of mode of transmission. 
How is it trans transmitted from child to child? <laughs> and then they play with toys, and then they play with other oh, no, toys like in their mouth, and they <laughs> sneeze all over them, they sneeze in each other's faces. Like you said, they're nasty, right? Because <laughs> they got the runny nose and it's like that, and then they share, okay? And so, you can hand wash to death, you're not going to stop it. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of important. In my day, if somebody had chicken pox, we all had to go hang out with the kid who had chicken pox until we got chicken pox. Do you okay. know that they, they purposely out share it. A report the other day about children getting drunk and sick off of hand sanitizer because they thought it was something to drink. This is how much we have hand sanitizer. Well, that's true. Wow. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> she did. She comes in. <laughs> Sorry, you only get that once. No, it's on YouTube forever. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yep. So it's important when you're going over your various uh, diseases, and I'm not going to have time to go over them all, but on the, the slides that follow have several diseases. Okay, like Coxsackie virus and rubella virus and, um, and on and on and on, all these childhood illnesses. It's important to understand the mode of transmission, the incubation period, and the, con uh, the, the communicable period. You know, for example, chicken pox, okay? How is chicken pox spread? Through direct contact with the, with the, uh, um, with the, uh, the, the sores, okay? And so when are they most uh, contagious? From, the, from just before the sores appear? until the sores have crusted over. Usually it's four to seven days. And then, um, uh, and, and uh, so when you're assessing a child, you're gonna say, so he was exposed to this. Well, when was he exposed to this? Well, was that within the communicable period? Yes, okay, then he may have it, all right? So think about those things when we go over the various diseases, okay? It'll start to make sense once you start to see it, okay? And then, how, how many children exposed to it will actually get the disease, okay? I love when they talk about, at this particular hospital, they had somebody who had hepatitis B, and nobody mentioned that he had, he never told anyone he had hepatitis B. And during the 10 years that he worked here, he saw 400,000 people. So he potentially exposed 400,000 people. Does that mean 400,000 people are gonna get hepatitis B? No. no. Very, very few of them are gonna get hepatitis B. Only the ones that he shared blood and body fluid with are going to get hepatitis B, right? You can't get it from being a dentist. Okay? You can't be a dentist and get hepatitis B because the dentist put his fingers in your mouth. Okay, so you have to understand how is it spread and what is the chances of getting it. The other one is like um, last year there was a lot of problems with um, kids who... Who, who didn't get the measles vaccination, I think it was. Yeah. And then they went to Disneyland while they had the measles. And they potentially exposed all these children. Okay, potentially exposed them. First of all, only the ones that they came in direct contact with and sneezed. And secondly, a lot of those who were exposed won't get the measles anyway. Okay, so it's not like, a, it's not like bubonic plague where, the, um, where the, the pathogenicity is very, very high. It's usually fairly low. And so... It's our job as, as a healthcare providers to be able to teach the public, you know, we don't have to freak out about everything, okay? Sometimes we can go, it's okay. A <laughs> little increased risk, not the end of the world. We'll see what happens, okay? And we have to know the reservoirs where, and the routes of transmission, where the, where the bad guys live and how they get there, okay? And then, of course, in order to get sick, you need a susceptible host. Now, do we all know the difference between viral infections, bacterial infections, and fungal infections. You've had this before? Microbiology. Microbiology, okay. So, okay, so a viral infection. Okay, what is a viral infection? An infection caused by a virus, okay. And are viruses living creatures? No. Well, they're alive, right? They're, they're not bacteria, but they are, they are living, okay. Um, and uh, that's why live viruses are more dangerous than than, uh, than uh, what are the other ones called? Attenuated, Attenuated viruses, right? Um, but, uh, um, uh, but they're not spread in the same way that bacteria is spread, right? So li viruses are spread by taking over the cell and making the cell replicate, whereas bacteria, it multiplies on its own, like you know, moms and dads having babies, right? And um, <laughs> does antibiotics work against viruses? No. No, they don't. That's my so, favorite. 
I have a cold, I need an antibiotic. Yeah, yeah. doesn't work, right? Because a cold is a viral illness, mm -hmm. not a bacterial illness. Are ear infections viral or bacterial? Uh, Both. Uh, okay. And the biggest problem we have is trying to figure out how to tell the difference between a viral illness and a bacterial illness. Okay. Now, what's a fungal illness? Cousin. Caused by a fungus, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Does everybody get fungal illness? Mm -hmm. No. You have to be susceptible, right? You have to be at a period where, where you're likely to get it. We're constantly exposed to fungal illness all the time, and we don't get them, okay? But if sometimes you're susceptible. You change your diet a little bit, alters your vaginal pH, you get a yeast infection, hello, fungal infection, okay? Pee little in kids shower. with, what's that? Pee in the shower. Pee in the shower? That gets a fungal infection? Yeah, you want to add these food, but... Yeah, you pee oh, on it and you if you pee it. on it while you, oh, there you go, kill the fungus? Yeah. There you go. Oh, I thought you just said, like, peeing in the shower. Yeah. Give you yeah. yeah. Good. No, 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 you, you pee in the shower. No, I thought you said, like, gives you a shower. I'm like, why don't we have a yeah. shower? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> But most people who get fungal infections are either exposed to overwhelming fungal fungus in their environment or they're immunocompromised a little bit. Which is why pregnant women have more immune fungal yeast infections than non-pregnant women. Okay? Um, the, uh, 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 another time it's really popular to get fungal infections if you're living in a moist environment. Okay? Like down here in the south, where things are really humid and there's fungus and mold all over all the walls. Fungal infections are more common there. A ringworm is a big one. Okay? Which is not a worm. <laughs> and then there's bacteria, single-celled living organisms that are everywhere. And they are the ones that respond to, bacteria, to antibiotics. Funguses don't respond to antibiotics. Viruses don't respond to antibiotics. Okay? We use antivirals for, anti, for viruses, antifungals for funguses, and, and antibiotics for bacterial infections. Okay? Now, uh, unfortunately, the signs of bacterial infection and viral infection are very, very similar. Okay? Fever, malaise, anorexia, itching, okay? um, or rashes. Uh, in, in, in childhood illnesses, you'll see these symptoms over and over and over again. Now, um, the difference is, if you want to kind of fine-tune it a little bit, um, uh, in viral illnesses, they have flu-like symptoms, okay? Very high fevers, not 100 degrees or 100.4, but 100 point, 104, 105, those are viral illnesses uh, quite often, okay? Um, and they tend to be more immediate, like the first sign you get is a fever and malaise, and then you get kind of sick, okay? Whereas bacterial illness, you have something kind of leading up to it, and then you become septic, okay? So it's usually a more of a delayed illness. So when people say, you know, I got sick, I was really weak and tired yesterday, and today I have a high fever, I automatically think viral illness first where they say, I had this bump on my skin and it kind of spread over a few days and now I'm really sick and I have a fever, that's a bacterial illness, okay? Because bacteria has to replicate and they do so very slowly and they spread out from the source of the infection, where viral illnesses take over the whole body very quickly, okay? And you confirm them, I'm sorry? A sore throat? Sore throat, well, it's a, it, that could be either, you know? That's just a symptom of infection. Okay, whether it's viral or, or um, bacterial. Although, like, if you have a viral ear, ear infection, you get this really high fever, but everything else is kind of relaxed. We have a bacterial ear infection. Everything is bright red and hot and inflamed, and it comes on gradually. Same thing with uh, th sore throats. Like, strep, strep throat is an aggressive uh, throat uh, in infection. But someone who has, got, has a, a viral infection it's, it's not nearly as aggressive, not nearly as red and plain. Okay. But I don't want to confuse you. Just know that both viral and, and uh, bacterial tend to come on with fever, malaise, um, anorexia, and uh, rashes. Okay. And you can, confirm, you can confirm the diagnosis, by the way. Uh, when you're getting a culture, what are you doing? Growing back. You're looking for bacteria, right? And if you get a culture and it's negative, and they have this fever and malaise, what does it mean? Viral, Viral right? Yeah. Exactly. You get a culture and culture is positive, aha, I get antibiotics now, mm -hmm. right? And we culture secretions, we culture uh, direct contact areas, right? We can't do blood cultures there, there. You have to be really sick for a blood culture to come back positive, okay? How do they culture blood? Like, do they put it in a plate? Like 
Yeah. No. Just like they would anything else. They just put it on a plate, stretch, oh, yeah. strike it out, and see what it'll grow. Okay. And the cure for your infections is um, promoting immune function with good skin care, optimizing nutrition, rest, drinking water, and proper assessment. The biggest care cure for infection, sorry, biggest cure for infection is to prevent the spread. And how do we prevent the spread? Hand washing. Hand washing. There you go. Good hand washing and good oral hygiene and good like sneezing. Not you. Not that you. Right. <laughs> I am forever wanting to kill my teenage son. Because he'll be like, Look, what the hell's wrong with you? I don't want your boogers on me. You know? You can shoot that 25 feet. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, it's net. It goes, it's crazy what it'll do, right? It's hilarious, but it's gross. The way you look the camera, you can actually see like, how much it's like, yeah. where it's going, and it's like, yeah. and even if it's not pathologic, I don't want your boogers all over me. So, so control the sneezing. Washing toys, cleaning surfaces, and using disposable things whenever you can, right? That's the key. I'm like, no, stop picking your boogers. Yeah. So now we go into a series of infections, okay? Fist disease. Anyone know what fist disease is? Several different names for it. It's human parvovirus, B19, okay? They call it slap, some, some people call it fat, slap face disease. I've seen it called hand, foot, and mouth disease. Um, but fist disease, it's erythema infectiosa. And it begins with a facial rash uh, on the cheeks. And that's why they call it slap face disease, because kids look like this all day. The bright red cheeks. They, sure they look like their kids are, are their faces smacked, right? <laughs> um, can't have a fever. It's self-limiting. Usually goes away very quickly. Okay. And the diagnosis is often made through signs and symptoms. While you could theoretically do um, do an antibody test, it's not worth it most of the time. Most of the time, you bring your child into the doctor with he's got a little fever. They go, okay, he'll be fine in a few days. Leave him alone. You know, just, just control the fever and come back, okay? But you keep them away, but this is funny, keeping them away from pregnant women. Why would we want to keep them away from pregnant women? Because parvo is bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're pregnant. Of course, most women who are pregnant have already had parvo, and they don't have to worry about it. It's a childhood illness, okay? But staying away from pregnant women, if you're pregnant, stay away from sick children. Using Tylenol or, or Motrin to bring the temperature down to treat the high fever, the sore throat, and the headache and droplet precautions if he's in a hospital, okay? Uh, cytomegalovirus, another one of those that kills babies real well, so we want to keep them away. They're, they're a member of the herpes family. It's another virus. Oftentimes they're asymptomatic, okay? But if a baby is born with it, they can be, they can have, if they get it in utero, they can be very, very sick. Older children just get the standard stuff, very much like mono, headache, fever, malaise, they can have a rash. All of these things are going to sound very, very similar. Okay? Um, you'll see down here this retinitis can cause blindness with CMV associated with HIV or AIDS. Anytime you're immunocompromised and you get a virus, it can make you very sick all the way around. Okay? Yeah. Cytomegalovirus tends to be a, uh, an aggressive virus. The body can handle it 99% of the time, but if you get it in utero or you get it while you have HIV, it can make you incredibly sick. Okay, times when you're immunocompromised. Okay. It's diagnosed in the blood and the saliva. And we do the same thing, we just wait until it goes away. Okay. Is it reoccurring or is it just it's gone? It's it's well all viruses are lifelong. Once you've had them, you will always have them. Um, it's uh, uh, and it, it, it would uh, I, it, it could come back during periods of stress. It's a herpes virus. So okay, it's just like all the other herpes viruses, okay. in that it tends to hit, and it hits well for a while, and then by the end of the first year, it'll go away. Um, and then it usually doesn't come back. But if you get particularly ill, it can come back while you're ill, when you're weak. That's what that, I thought you said it was herpes, that's why I just wanted some clarification. Yeah, it's a herpes virus. And you guys know the life cycle of herpes is usually one year, that you get it, you have multiple infections for the first year, and then you stop getting it. And then you only get it during periods of stress. Um, you're not sleeping well for a few nights and all of a sudden you'll get a cold sore or a genital lesion or something like that. Okay. Is that, is that with chickenpox too or is that Not so different? much chickenpox. Chickenpox when it comes back, it usually comes back as shingles. 
And that's a very different disease from chicken pox. Yeah. So what do they do with moms that have this side of cytomegalovirus? We just monitor them real closely. Can't do anything to deliver. You know, we we watch them. If the baby starts to get sick and die, we deliver him before he dies. But otherwise, we just kind of watch him. Try to get him to term. Okay. Herpes simplex virus. The, one of the most common viruses known to man. You know there are two types, type one and type two. And as a general rule, type two is on the labia. I mean, on the mouth. <laughs> And the way I remember this is, uh, is um, you have only one mouth and you have two labia. So type 1 is on the mouth and type 2 is on the labia. Right? And they make very classic blisters, right? The very classic clear fluid filled blisters. That's, they come in a tight little cluster. Uh, they look like a, like you know five or six little blisters all together, very, very classic. And if you've ever seen someone with a cold sore, you know exactly what herpes on the genitals look like. The exact same, okay? And they act the same, and they feel the same, and they're all the same all the way around. Is there a reason why one and two, they just go to different areas and that's the name for it? They or? tend to, but they don't any, that's not the case anymore. We, more and more, we're like, I could care less whether it's type 1 or type 2, it's exactly the same. Okay. In the, the old days, what's that? It's just the area where it's located. It's where it wants to be, it's where it prefers to be. But you can have type 2 on your lips and you can have type 1 on your genitals. It doesn't, it no longer differentiates. It used to be before, like, you know, the, the concept revolution. being with the sexual revolution <laughs> that we are now taking oral herpes and putting it on other people's genitals far more often than we used to. Yeah, okay. And vice versa. Taking it off of their genitals and putting it on our lips far more often. And so it doesn't really matter anymore. We just call it herpes in general. Okay. And in pregnancy, herpes is really only a problem either A, they never had it before and they get genital herpes during their pregnancy, or B, uh, they have an active herpes lesion on the genitals when the baby is born. But if a woman is pregnant and she's had herpes, you know, since she was 12, and she gets an outbreak while she's pregnant, it means nothing. We, we could care less. It's only the primary outbreak that means anything. When you're doing the exams, and you know, they, can you see if they actually have an outbreak in the, mm -hmm. the canal? Like, I sure know can. in the labia you can't. Yeah. At birth, when they go into labor and they have a history of herpes, we actually do a speculum exam and look at the walls of the vagina and we look at the cervix and we look for everything. We, we look at the, the entire genital tract mm -hmm. to look for an active lesion. The doctor lesion. did okay. that at um, yeah. one of my patients. Yeah. She, was, she had herpes and he checked her, but he didn't do a whole speculum thing. But I, I, I'm confused because I thought you said that only the first outbreak It's only matters. the first outbreak in pregnancy and any active lesions in labor. Okay. Yeah. The, the idea is that the baby will make direct contact with the and lesion then, and get it in his eyes or his brain. Yes. I had a patient who, um, if you, like, she had, like, it was like the third or fourth child, and we were looking at her records from her past kids, mm -hmm. and it was not funny, but it was funny that, like, one pregnancy who said she had her piece, the next said she didn't, and the one said she didn't, and then now she's saying she didn't again. Yeah. And so we, uh, you know, you have to go through and check yes or no or whatever, all the things. So like, have you ever had her piece? And she's like, no. But two other pre pregnancies she had, two other yeah. she hadn't, so we're like, <clears throat> yep. And what does that mean? Patients lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Patients that means. always lie. Yeah. They don't always the lie, though. but they do tend to protect themselves. They're going to protect their, their reputation, their, 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 you know. They don't, no one wants to say, I have herpes, right? Yeah. But it looks the same and, in the canal, right? It's, yeah, exactly. So, it looks okay. the same, yeah. And you diagnose it by getting a sample and sending it to the lab. Break the blister open, take a little bit of the, of the liquid on a Q-tip and send it to the lab. Okay. Um, nursing care. You can give a topical acyclovir. Uh, they have, what's that stuff called in the little tubes that they use for the mouth? Um, Abrivo. A, Abrivo, Abrivo, or something. Abrivo. Abrivo, there you go, Abrivo. It's a topical antiviral. Or you can give them acyclovir, famcyclovir, pencyclovir. They all work, they all work pretty well. Okay. And of course, careful hand washing. Don't touch it and leave it alone. And if you do touch it, wash your hands like crazy.
They, they can spread up the face. They can even get it into the eyes because the eyes is a mucous membrane just like the mouth. Right. And they can, they can, you can go blind if you get herpes in your eye. So if it's, not, if it's on the lip and it stays there, who cares? If it's moving up the face or you see something over here, you need to they need to be aggressively treated and sent to ophthalmology. Okay? And the education is wash it. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. It spreads like crazy. Excuse me. It spreads like crazy in children because they share sodas and stuff all the time. And a kid with a cold sore needs to be, you know, isolated. And he needs to know not to tell anyone else or not to share things when he's got signs of a cold sore. The trick to herpes is that you're, you're contagious before the outbreak. And so when, from the moment you start getting prodromal symptoms, you're already contagious. And so they won't have any lesions or anything, but they'll get like a tingling or whatever, or tingling down there, and they'll, they, they'll you know, share something, and they've just exposed someone else. Now, just because they're exposed doesn't mean they'll get herpes. doesn't mean they'll get a cold sore, but it just increases the risk of your exposure, you might get it. Right. And then herpes zoster is shingles, okay, caused by the chickenpox virus. First we get exposed to the chickenpox virus, and then as we age, we get, uh, it comes back, and it comes back instead of a full body chickenpox, it comes back as a rash along the nerve route in the trunk. Mm -hmm. It tends to be right across here, or a little bit lower, but it runs from the, from the spine around the trunk to the midline, uh, along the nerve routes, uh, coming out of the spine. Is it and, What's that? Is it always there? Mine was on my head, so I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, these exactly. I've, I've, it on, like, in on their, their face. Eyes. Yeah, I've only known it on the trunk, but I'm I'm okay with saying that that it could be anywhere. <laughs> I know I get these weird uh, trigeminal neuralgia things. I never break out or anything, but I get like my whole face will will get um, tingly and burn, and I take acyclovir and it gets better. So, but I never have gotten a, a zoster uh, reaction, but I get the tingling like I get it. Gotta love chicken pox. Oh look, nerve pattern on the face, trunk, and upper back. All right, let's stop talking because this is boring me. Okay. I am not going to talk about these things next week. You are going to read these things. Okay. Okay. On the API, what chapters do you cover? Let's see. On the ATI? What do you mean? Was it all inclusive from the beginning? I don't know. It's the ATI. We took it today, and it was all a maternal child, right?